now I had him in front of me and my whole life I had planned, I'm going to, I'm going to slap him. I'm going to tell him he didn't break me. I have so much to show him. There was no need. I was at peace. I was, I was healing and I felt compassion for him, which I know is not me. It, that's only the Holy <laughs> Spirit that lives mm-hmm. inside me because I thought I'm released from my jail. I'm free now. I, I'm mm-hmm. no longer a prisoner of depression, of trauma. I'm being released and now he's going into jail. Rosie Rivera, I am so glad you are with us. Uh, I've been actually really excited to listen to you and speak with you Mm -hmm. today. So this is a thrill. And welcome to Canada. Welcome to Canada. Yes, I love (laughs) Canada. I love Canada. I've been there once and it's gorgeous. Yes, yes, yes. We went to Vancouver. Mm -hmm. (gasps) Went to Vancouver. The first time Mm -hmm. I ever saw a gorgeous bald eagle was in Canada and I'll never forget. (laughs) gorgeous gorgeous eagle I don't know if it was a bald eagle but it was an eagle and it was yep. majestic yes and uh, so I'll never forget other than you know great people um so yeah thank you thank you Canada I, I I'm coming back so I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad so to glad be I, here. I hope you do and next time you do come up uh Rosie will have to hang out in our studio and uh, meet a lot of my girlfriends and and uh, I know we'd have a lot of fun so Uh, Rosie, this series that you're a part of is called SOS, which I love. I always think about Sting singing, I'm sending out an SOS, and it's in my head, the song, right? Uh, But I'm glad you're a part of the series because this series really is about summer of strength, Uh, hearing incredible stories of incredible people who have really demonstrated strength and resilience and grit and perseverance. Mm. And then also learning from some, some hard things that, you know, you have gone through. So I don't want to give too much away, but I want to start with (laughs) your childhood and your story, uh, the trauma and things you've gone through and just your life. And I'm just going to listen and learn, ask you some questions. And at the end, just ask you, you know, for some takeaways and, and lessons that you, you have. So let's start off with sure. you as a, a, as a child, let's start with your childhood and a bit about that, so, that part of it. Awesome. Uh, I'm the sixth child of two Mexican American parents. So my parents migrated in the sixties, um, to, to LA from Mexico. Um, my dad and mom were both very hardworking. We lived in poverty, um, and had no idea, but just because wow. love reigned in the house. I mean, I'm, I'm the baby. So I was just extra loved. I don't want to say spoiled, but that's what my older brothers would think. Um, <laughs> You know, dad would say no one can touch Rosie and Jenny. Jenny is my older sister. A lot of people know her as Jenny Rivera. She is a huge, was a huge regional Mexican star. The only regional Mexican artist to sell out the Staples Center, like man or woman. Wow. Um, Wow. The only one. And um, after she passed away, another group did it, but she's the first. And um, we didn't know that we lacked anything just because love filled every gap and every hole. Mm. Uh, but we did live in a lot of poverty. Dad always worked two or three jobs. My mom always worked two or three jobs. And um, our brothers kind of raised us, in my case, my sister. So when mom was working, I always wanted to be with Che. I call her Che. And um, she had been married by then. Jenny got pregnant at 15, moved in with her husband. And I knew him since I was four um, or earlier. So he was just a family member. He was like a, a brother. That's how we treat in-laws, their, their family. So um, one day him and Jenny were fighting. There was a lot of domestic violence and we were used to hearing it to that point where you heard thumps against the wall and you were just like, it's going to be mm. fine. Um, mm. And Jenny went out to go buy some spaghetti for me. I had requested meatballs in the spaghetti she was making and she treated me like her doll. She would say that I was her birthday gift when she was 12. I, I was an answered prayer to her and she went to go get these meatballs and uh, I was playing with her daughter. I was eight at the time and Cheeky's her daughter was four and her husband comes into the room and makes Cheeky's leave, which confused me, Mm -hmm. um, and says, hey, do you want to play? So to an eight year old in the 80s um, who had no idea about sex or abuse or anything other than love, 
I had never even been spanked before. Um, I didn't, I said, sure, you know, um, there is a respect and there's a love and an, a, a, Jenny really loved him. So therefore we really loved him and he was never mean to me. Um, it was never, there was never any thought of why this game could go wrong, but he called it the love game, which made it even an easier yes for an eight year old and um, began to touch me. So it didn't hurt. And for a child, usually something wrong comes with pain. So when there's an absence of pain and you don't, and you haven't been told that this is wrong, you, you only end up um, confused because it doesn't hurt physically, but when it's over, you feel just dirty. I felt dirty. I felt Mm -hmm. like I was hurting my sister. I like, I I knew something was wrong, but didn't understand what, and this kind of went on for about a year. Um, a few times I started noticing that whenever him and Jenny would fight, I would kind of become the target. Um, Mm -hmm. but again, I just knew what I felt like after he was never mean. He was never violent until fifth grade. I was in sex ed class and I saw the, the human body, man and woman, and all the little Mm -hmm. girls around me were giggling and being shy. Right. Like, Oh, like, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to me, it was like, uh, I see this all the time. Why are you? And it's not even correct on the screen. And I remember thinking how abnormal they were and then how abnormal I was. Mm -hmm. And it made me so mad to Mm -hmm. to not have a chance to be normal is how I felt. Um, And then I got so upset at feeling, uh, what's the word, ignorant of feeling dumb because I was the straight A student. I, I... I, the one thing Rosie had that was different from her family was that I was super, super studious, both Jenny and I were, and super intelligent. And so dad used to tell me you could be an, well, I used to tell dad, um, I want to be an astronaut. And he said, you can do it. I want to be a teacher. You can do it. I, I want to be, you know, the people that keep the city clean and pick up the trash every Tuesday. You can do it. There was nothing too high or too low for me. And so to feel that for a full year, I had been fooled. I was so livid that I threw up in class. That's how, that's when the anger came in. So then the next time he tried to do it, um, I remember vividly, um, I was the first time I said no, the first time I even spoke up because before I would just freeze, I would freeze, close my eyes, pretend that this wasn't happening to me. I would go into like Mm -hmm. Claudia from the babysitter's club. I live in New York. I'm somewhere else. Books really saved my life at that point. Mm -hmm. And, but this was the first time I said no. And he covers my mouth. And now I know that that's the moment he robbed my voice. He covers my mouth and threatens me. And he's, 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 he's not yelling. He's like hissing because there happens to be people outside, which is super key because sometimes we imagine sexual abuse happens when two people are alone or strangers Mm -hmm. or no, it's, it's usually from the research I've done and the stories that I've heard at family parties, they, somewhere where the people are kind of entertained, they're not, and the kids are playing in the room. That's sometimes when an adult or even sometimes other children, it just, it, it, it varies. There isn't really a profile. Um, so I know that there was people outside of this restroom and he was hissing at me to be quiet. And he says, if you ever tell anyone, I'll kill your sister. Oh, just super interesting to me because he knew my weakness. Yeah. Um, it wasn't killing me. It was killing the most important person in my life at that time. And he knew it later. I heard he threatened his daughter because after he stopped sexually abusing me, I got to a certain age, um, where he was no longer interested or no, I was no longer at his reach. He started to Mm -hmm. sexually abuse his daughter. And I, I knew years later, he told her, I'll make you live with grandma, the, his mom. So that was her biggest fear. And, and I just, these are people not only with authority, but that prey on the weak in the sense that they know our weaknesses. Not that mm-hmm. I was weak. I was a child, but he knew my weakness and that's what he stuck to. Um, so I didn't speak. I swore at the age of nine that oh, I would Rosie. carry this by myself. Mm-hmm. Um that my sister would not go through this pain, that I would not have my mother go through this, that my brothers would not go to jail because surely they would kill him. And, and that I didn't even want him to die because then it would kind of be my fault. So for, I, I carried this weight on my shoulders of being everyone's protector and savior. 
And in the mist asking woman who protects me, because dad said no one could touch Rosie, but someone is literally touching Rosie. Like I had so much time to think about oh. this. I no longer played with Barbies. I no longer dreamt of being an astronaut. It was just survival mode. And then by the age of 13, anger mode, I want to kill him and then kill myself. And then that my life is done. I don't, I don't need to do anything else. Um, Rosie, if was I become, there any, yeah, was there anyone you could tell or you just did not trust anyone because of fear? I could, I could have told my family, but I was scared. Right. I mean, him and Jenny, because of the domestic violence, mm-hmm. it was evident that he could kill her. The, the, the fighting got worse and worse and it was mm-hmm. both of them. So I said, they'll kill each other. Um, so I could have, I mean, um, there was friends I could have told, but then you think, I'm only going to put them in a mess because what can she really do for me? Whether it's, you know, um, by the age of 16, um, he threatened the same thing that took away my voice was the same thing that released my voice because that same threat, um, he threatened to take away the kids. Him and my sister had divorced now. They had three children and she was becoming a singer kind of accidentally because accidentally to us, but all planned by God. We didn't have any any necessarily talent. There are no singers in my family. My dad was just making, you know, keeping us fed. And so sometimes he sold oranges and then sometimes he took pictures at nightclubs and other days he said, Hey, someone asked him, you know, do you record artists? Do you have a recording studio? He said, yes. And he did it. He said, I'll (laughs) learn how to do it. (laughs) And so he, he was recording artists. He accidentally became a producer and my sister joined him. And so she was growing in her fame and this only brought her problems with her ex. So he was going to take the kids away and she didn't know what to do. She's like, mom, what if they do take the kids away? What if I'm too busy? Because she was also doing real estate. So, and she was afraid and her fear broke my heart. So I said, I have the solution. Um, and I, I told her she, I don't know if there's a right time because I just decided that day, today is the day I remember I was in sixth period and I knew I had to do it or I was going to back out because I had had, I had thought what if so many times and Mm. there was always a reason not to do it. So I, I mean, I couldn't even write sexual abuse. I had a journal, but I couldn't write out the word. I couldn't write rape. I couldn't write it. There was, I, I, so I didn't know how I was going to do it. There was no plan. It was just like, Jenny Mm. needs to know today's the day. And that was sixth period. And I walked straight to her office and God is so good. God is so good that Mm. when I made the decision, when I was ready, he, he put everything in place and he really, really did because I did not have to say the word rape or sex or molestation. She just asked all the right questions. And Mm. what I take away from that now is when you have to ask someone the, the easiest thing to answer to is, is someone hurting you? Because that leaves open space to take the guilt off of me. You know, did something happen? You can kind of say, I did do something, you know, but she asked, is someone hurting you? So Rosie, is that a good thing for us to note? Like if we have identified that there could be a situation that, a child or someone we know is being sexually abused or raped that you're saying yeah. that's a good question to ask them. I, I would say yes. It, yeah. Okay. I've thought about it over and over and mm-hmm. people have asked me and, and that was a question Jenny asked me that allowed me to feel space the give me the space to say that's yes. Good. All that's I had good. to say was yes. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to go on, but before this Jenny was building trust Jenny, I could tell her anything and she would love me through it. And I knew that Jenny was someone that chose to believe you no matter how crazy the story story Mm -hmm. sounded. Jenny was someone that would stick with you. Even if you were wrong, she would tell you, I don't agree with this, but I'm not going to leave you in it. Mm -hmm. So knowing all of that at 16, because by 16, I had, I was already on a wrong path. I was dating way too much. I was drinking. And so she knew something is wrong. And she would tell me, Hey, take it easy on the alcoholic. What are you doing? You know, she would Mm -hmm. scold me if I got 
caught ditching class, but she'd also say, but I love you. So I'm not going to leave you. I just think this is, so that really opened up a path of communication. Mm -hmm. So even before asking the question, I would say, make sure this person can trust you. And that doesn't mean you're talking about super deep topics. Not all the time. Your four-year-old can be talking about Dora the Explorer and you give her the attention as if Mm -hmm. Dora the Explorer is the most important thing to you because it is to her. You have no idea. Like the, 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 I used to talk, my daughter used to talk about, um, Lindsay McGuire, all Lizzie McGuire Mm -hmm. all day. And I would just listen to her and say, and I would ask questions as if, because it is important. And so when I knew that my life was important to her, then I could tell her. Um, so I was still scared though. It is still Mm -hmm. very scary. Um, but the fact that she would just ask me questions and when I said yes, she kind of had a sense and I don't know why other than there was stuff going on in the world. There was a little bit speaking about sexual abuse in, in an other area of our life. And I had noticed that my family's reaction was we should protect this young lady, this young girl. And when I saw that, then I I said, okay, if I speak up, at least I know that my family will be concerned and not blame. So your reaction to someone else's story is vital. If see, hmm. if, if you're watching TV, if you hear it in the news and your reaction is to victim blame is to victim question with like demeaning terms, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then your child will feel that it's towards her, that, that you will have, and you probably won't. I mean, this is your child and we're talking about, Mm -hmm. but your child doesn't know that. So if you see it on TV and there are questions, valid questions, I would keep them away from the child. I would ask them in a, in a more mature group or pray about it, but definitely show like, concern of, Hey, I hope justice Mm -hmm. is, is, you know, I hope they figure this out. Let's pray for this young girl. Let's pray even for the predator. Let's, let's let the truth come out right? because that way you're not choosing sides. Yeah. So Rosie, when you're sharing with your sister, was there like a weight lifted off or was there still fear and trepidation? Like what was, what was going Mm. through? Because it's almost like it's spoken out. I can't take it back. Right. Like it's, it's out. Uh Uh-oh. Uh, now what? You know yeah. what I mean? What what was going on with you as you were doing It that? was like the earthquake that set Paul and Silas free. It, it <laughs> felt like an earthquake. Woo! I mean, chains okay. fell off. Chains mm. fell off, but there was also rumbling. Walls mm. were being taken down, but there was also destruction. And, and there was everything going into ruins, but with the opportunity of it being built again. Mm. That's so, good. There, there yeah. are consequences and I, and that's why, um, I don't ever like to pretend or say, Hey, the first time you speak up, everything's going to no. I, I still went down a path of mm-hmm. self-destruction until Christ found me at 25 because not only was I in pain, now my family was in pain, mm-hmm. but I never regret it because there was this release. There was this freedom mm-hmm. I wasn't holding a secret anymore. You know, the word says that when we hold a secret, it like dries our bones. That's how I felt. So when I finally spoke up and my family knew there was also in that pain, I understand Rosie now. I understand where the anger comes from. I I, I understand where like the the pain and the kind of isolation and the not wanting to play with men any like I, I didn't even want to play with my brothers anymore. We used to wrestle all the time as kids. And you now didn't I couldn't just even touch them. I didn't want my father to hug me. And so now there was an understanding of my person while not understanding the situation. So it it, it does help so much, but it is also a process. Yeah. So Rosie, here's the thing. So it's so amazing that your family listened and believed you. I have a number of girlfriends whose family did the exact opposite. It actually still makes me emotional because when they were brave enough to tell their parents, their parents' response was, I don't, we don't believe you. That didn't happen. Uh, There's no way that could have happened. And to this day, they're still working through this incredibly difficult journey and trust and God. And it's, it's very, very difficult. And so what would you say to that? Because it's like, you finally, like I'm listening to you and you've got this secret and then you finally share and imagine somebody saying, 
Are you sure? I don't think that so. Is, you know, that is your biggest fear coming to life. Like that, okay. it, it, it is so painful. It is a different level of pain. And some psychologists have said that it's even more painful or does more damage than the abuser himself. Oh, only, only if I think the only thing that can kind of like battle with that is if the abuser is the father. But mm. if the mother, if, if they does not believe the child and the mother has so much responsibility, that is a, a whole different wound and it can, it can be more damaging. So I would tell this person that the truth always comes to light, mm. that the truth does not have to defend itself. It just is. And that it mm. is very painful. And I can only imagine your pain. I mean, my aunt didn't believe me. She was my, my brother's, my, my father's sister. Mm-hmm. And we weren't very close and it was still painful. And there was a lot of anger in me towards mm-hmm. her. It took a long time to forgive her. I think I forgave the abuser and then forgave my aunt. And and that's so rare to say. So I can only imagine. But I've also seen that, that once you forgive and once you heal, mm-hmm. and with, with, even if your mother doesn't ask for forgiveness or you're your guardian, you will, you will be set free in a whole different way. And it is just you being set free from that. I'm a liar or I provoke this, like the the self blame that has been cast on because of someone else. Mm -hmm. They'll be free of this shame that, that we, I used to carry. Um, it is a process. And I would say maybe some counseling. I think sometimes we need someone to guide us down that path. It's the question is, even if I want to, how do I do it? How do I, how do I organize all these thoughts and all these feelings? And and someone can really help you do that. It mm-hmm. counseling has helped me tremendously. Yeah. For me, it was Christian counseling specifically. I tried, I tried so many things. And for me, the answer it was Christ. With Christ came counseling, Christian counseling, prayer, a lot of prayer, and. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thank God didn't have to forgive, say, my mother for not believing me, but my mother didn't want to talk about it. And, and that is also something, I don't know if it was the era or our culture or mm-hmm. the, the, I don't want anyone to see our family in a certain way. We mm-hmm. welcomed this person in. Um, but thank God my sister said, oh no, we're talking about it. I mean, I was telling the, giving the police report for the very first time that day, my family went. Oh, into is that action. what happened really quick? So you told your sister yeah. and that's what happened. She, they, they, that was another great thing. It's take action, whatever it can be, whatever mm-hmm. God puts in your heart. Maybe it's going straight to counseling for, for us. It was, we're making a police report and, okay. and he became a fugitive of the law, but just that action of like, we are together mm-hmm. in this. Now my brothers wanted to kill him. And we begged them not to. Like, like really, they, they like won't. they really wanted to kill him. This wasn't like yes. something like they were just saying they, it. This is like they no, were going to. No, 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 wow. no. My brother, they, he, they were, I mean, and I knew that one of my brothers was living kind of the crazy life. Um, and he, he had guns already. So, and they had already had altercations because of the physical abuse. So the, it was, it was going to happen. And my oldest brother, thank God, my oldest brother had been saved already. He was already a pastor or co-pastor. And he calmed everyone down. The, the respect that we had for him as a brother mm-hmm. um, really helped us say, well, if, if Pete says no, then we can't do it. And thank God there was that, that, that calm, godly person mm-hmm. that said, God's going to handle it. And mm-hmm. my dad was livid because my dad is not a believer, but we went more with what our brother said since our brother had kind of raised us. And we, we love and respect our dad, but he really calmed us down. And my, my dad said, no, I mean, we got to do something, but my dad wasn't going to kill him. My dad just wanted us to look for him and turn him in. Um, and he, so, was, he was a fugitive. So when he found out he went on the run. Yeah. Immediately. He said we were wow. lying, but he still went on the run. Um, and for nine years and in those nine years, the pressure of finding him, the pressure of justice is what kind of sent me down of, oh. I wasn't only like, 
drinking to numb the pain now. I was drinking for the stress. I was a 16 year old, 17, 18. I got to find him. I have to find him. You know, that pressure was, was on me of, of justice, get your justice girl. And, Mm. and I couldn't handle it. I, I, you know, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life and, and still going through the heartbreak. And, you know, I gained 50 pounds trying to make men not want me. And then I spent the rest of my teenage years trying to lose those 50 pounds because I wanted someone to like me. It was when I didn't like myself. I mean, the consequences that sexual abuse had on me, I was an 11 year old addicted to pornography. How is it? And you, and you, your mind does not comprehend how you like what you hate, how you, Mm. how you want what destroys you. It is, it is the worst. And there's this self-loathing, this questioning of what is wrong with me? I am really the dirty one here. But the word says in Song of Songs, don't wake up, love, before it's too soon. I took that later on of someone woke up my sexual desire way too soon. Mm-hmm. And my body didn't know if it was my uncle or my brother-in-law. They, my body just knows, hey, this feels good. But my mind knew. So my mind was always at war with my body. And definitely my heart was just confused. Is sex love? Love is sex? Do I mean, I, I was mm-hmm. so confused. Um, and that that's kind of like where, where the self-destruction came. That's why it was, I'll kill him and then I'll kill me. And we're both done with this. And, and my family will just be fine. And thank God Christ found me at 25. I was a single mom. I was married to just some guy. He, he liked me and it was not my baby's father. He had left me the day I told him I was pregnant. How, how old were you when you got pregnant with your first? 21. 21. I okay. was 21. I was in my last year of college. I was going to become an attorney to put him away. That was it. So it was just part of the plan. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I ended up pregnant my fourth year, my third year at Irvine. And I was, I was going to graduate early, which was great, but I was, I was pregnant and I was hurting and I was abandoned. I had gained, I was gaining 60 pounds with the pregnancy depressed. And I was still getting straight A's just because reading really, really saved me. It, it was my, my coping mechanism. And, uh, by the time the baby was two, I was really lonely. He wasn't coming back. I was waiting for him and he definitely wasn't coming back. He was dating someone while I was pregnant. And I, someone asked me, Hey, you want to marry me? I love you. I'll take you in with your daughter. And I believed him. We, he had been a family friend. We, I had known him since I was like about nine and he knew my whole life. He, he had been my best friend, but the third day into our marriage, someone stared at me in a desirable way in a bar. And he, he kind of lost it. He, he didn't want to lose me. So he took away all my clothes, like threw it away. Literally, I could only wear his clothes and he was about 300 pounds. So I I was wearing very baggy clothes. He threw away all my makeup and I couldn't hang out with any girlfriends because to him, all girls were bad. And I I was kind of like isolated. So one day um, he raped me inside a hotel room because I call it rape because I was very verbal about no, I did not. Mm-hmm. He had called me the worst names you can call a woman all day. That's what, that's all he did. It was very psychological, like abuse and verbal. You are dirt. You are the worst. Right. So then now you want to make love to me. I don't, I don't want to do it. I'm dirty. Mm-hmm. And, um, so he raped me and then he threw me out of the hotel room at two in the morning, only wearing his t-shirt Rosie. and my biggest fear was someone is going to see Lupio Rivera or Jenny Rivera's sister, and it's going to be on the tabloids. And that's just going to horrify my mother. I didn't even think of me. My body at this point had no value. I, I kind of was just used to it. And I just needed to not embarrass my family. And I, I, I knocked and begged him, please let me in, which has always stayed in my head of, sometimes we'd rather be with someone that abuses us than be alone in our pain. Like with him, at least I'm not alone. I I was begging him to let me back in Mm. because he was the only thing that I knew and that didn't work. So I went down to the reception area and it was, it was a very like little motel and the owner of the motel says, you know, get out of here. Or I'm going to call the cops. And I'm like, I don't understand. We, we bought the room. My husband is in, you know, room, whatever. And he said, no, I know what, what you are. I know what women like you are. And I really didn't even get it. I really, so I'm over oh. here like, 
<laughs> what do you mean? Uh, I, I paid for it. I'm not a thief. And he's like, no, prostitutes aren't allowed here. I'm going to call the cops. And I grabbed that title, which I had never done. I have done a lot of bad things, but that I haven't, I hadn't done yet, but mm-hmm. I grabbed it and put the label on myself and said, astronaut teacher, you know, first Mexican American woman on the Supreme court. No way. I am a prostitute. That is, that is what I am. And that is the day I decided I'm gonna kill myself. You know, by this time, mom was, had already been a believer. She had been praying for me for 11 years every day inviting me to church, telling me how much God loved me. I would always say whatever. I didn't believe, I didn't, I didn't know. I knew it wasn't God's fault, but I didn't know he cared. And I said, even if I go to hell, like, because that was my fear with suicide, I'm going to do it. I can't, I can't anymore. And my daughter will be better off without me. She, I really thought she would. And I started like walking the streets. I had alcohol and like 40 Tylenol in me and just walking, waiting for someone to like rape me or kill me. And, and no one did. I was screaming. I, I imagine what I look like now and not one person for two hours of me walking down the street at two in the morning said anything to me. And now I know that mm. that was God protecting me, Yes, that, that he will protect us from ourselves, from our own plans. Sometimes we're so frustrated because our plans aren't working and we get so mad at him, but he knows I'm protecting you from you. I, I know the self-sabotage. I know why you're going this path. Mm-hmm. And, and so I finally yelled at him. It was the first time I had ever talked to him. And, and I was just like, you know what? Do what you want with me. Like my life is yours. And I'm going to just lay here in the street. And if someone runs me over or kills me and I wake up in your presence, you know what you do. Like my life, I was, I, you see what I'm saying? My life is yours. But, and, uh, now I know what I was saying and I'm so glad I was saying it, even if I was saying it in ignorance Mm -hmm. and, um, I fell asleep and I hear his voice. It's not audibly. It's in my stomach. It's, it's deep in me. And all he says is that's enough. Go home. And I wake up like one of those, I, and no one was around me. I looked around and I said, I know I heard something and I hear mm-hmm. it again. Mm-hmm. And this, this firm, loving voice inside me that was just like, that's enough. Go home. So I said, I have a decision to make. I'm going to keep running from this God or I'm going to talk to him. And I swear mm-hmm. I'm so brave. I will fight anywhere. I will face anything am I going to be bold enough to really talk to my creator and really lay it all out? Cause that to me was boldness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm going to stop running from him. I'm just, what if mom is right? What if in this crazy world, mama is right, that he is full of mercy. What if he could love me? I'm going to give it a shot. So I answered him. Well, where's my home? Like I'll, I'll listen. I'll do it. But good question. That's a good question. Where, right? minute, where are you going? Are you going back to this husband exactly. in the motel what is what is home yeah good or co- good or, question. or do I go home and feel like a failure like yeah. my mom's home and I'm only gonna make her suffer again she suffered mm-hmm. so much in my teen years but mo- where do I where am I received and accepted I know me I I was already I was still addicted to porn super deep in like alcohol probably dependent on drugs you know um I, I, the only thing I had on me was like, I'm going to make it through college. Um, I was in law school at that time and I was like a functioning mess, but I was confused sexually. Um, I had been way too promiscuous and now, now I was dabbing into women because I didn't know. Um, I, where I had had an abortion at 17 that it really was killing me inside. Mm -hmm. Where would someone like me really have a home where she can rest. And I cry because I know that there is women Mm -hmm. that still feel like this now. And I begged God, don't let me forget so that I can still find her so that I can be a home so that we can be a home. Um, But where can I rest? Where can I lay my head and, and feel loved just as I am before I change? I want to change. What if I can't? Will I still have a home? And the Holy Spirit is so good. Oh, I love him so much. <laughs> that everything my mom, ha- my mom had told me for 11 years, as soon as I asked a question, came back. Hey, you know what mama said? That, that, that God's 
house is the house of prayer is everyone's home that everyone is received there that it won't close the doors not to drug addicts or prostitutes or nobody we will not close the door and my church never had so i i had seen it like mm-hmm. I, even if i would go they would still receive me and i was hung over and so mom's church never had closed the door to anyone and that's that's your home i'll receive you there and everything bible verses east to the west like worship songs from when i was 13 came into my mind and i said okay i'll go i'm going and i called my mom it was it was like i don't know what time five six in the morning and i said hey mom are you going to church today why because <laughs> i had <laughs> never asked her and i said hey because uh i want to go and i think she was shocked and said, I mean, because look, I kind of skipped over a little bit. Um, when I was 16 and I got home at four in the morning, just doing every single horrible thing that mm-hmm. I could do, she was waiting for me all the time. And we would always get into this, this argument because I would answer back. And, and I love her because she would tell me Jesus loved me, but she also showed me through discipline. You know, those boundaries really helped me feel loved, even though I would fight her on it. And so one day I I go into my room and I'm just like, lady, whatever, like you're going to start again, leave me alone. And I would go into my room and pretend I was asleep. Well, she puts anointing oil on her hands (laughs) and places them over me. She's not even praying anymore because I knew my mom prayed for me. At this point, she's not praying. She is declaring. And she says, you are a woman of God. You are an evangelist. And with your story, you will bring thousands and thousands and thousands of hurting women to his presence. You are a worshiper and and she's, I, I felt bad for her. I said, my poor mom, yeah. but she doesn't, she did know. She just decided to hear what the heavens said about me and see what the heavens were showing her about me rather than what she was really seeing. Isn't so that amazing, was, Rosie? Like you need people to see beyond what you think that you are, who you are. Like I, that's one yes. of the things that when I have, you know, been, I've been speaking for like 25 years across Canada and the world. And when I speak to older audiences like moms and grandmas. That's the one thing I say. First of all, prayer. I mean, that's what my parents yes. did where mm-hmm. they were on their knees every night praying for me because they had no idea. I mean, I'm in the clubs and I'm clubbing in Toronto mm-hmm. and I'm with guys and I'm doing everything. But my parents saw saw what I could become, saw me in more than what I could see for myself. And I love <sighs> that. That's powerful. I think that's a good lesson yes. for like speak that over people yep. because you never know and and or you do know that they feel that they're only this or they're small right. or they're only what people say they are like labeled as a prostitute but to speak right. over people that you're more that you're an, you're an evangelist you're an influencer you're like that's powerful rosie yes like that, it's just a good reminder i didn't know good it reminder. at the time yeah, yeah i didn't know it at the time and and having visionaries in your life we, yes. we need yes. and vocal visionaries because sometimes we see like, oh, she sings well. And then we don't say it or, you know, like, no, say it. Hey, baby, mm-hmm. I tell my seven year old daughter, you could be on Broadway. Like, I see you. And it just she doesn't have to do it. It's just it opens up the possibilities yeah, for I love her. That. And so I, I later, you know, I'm calling my mom uh, mm-hmm. several years later and and she says, do not make me late to church because even <laughs> though I'm the pastor's mama. They won't let me sing if I'm late. I said, no, mom, I won't. I won't be late. I promise. Mm-hmm. So the whole drive to church, she was just so quiet. And I think she was afraid to say anything because I would turn right back around. Mm-hmm. And I was still hungover and just, I had been smoking. I just, oh, I, I can imagine. She, in, other, in any other day, she would have been embarrassed. But today she just knew. Mm-hmm. And, and Christ saved me that day. I mean, he... I'll never forget the feeling. I don't remember what they preached about, but I remember the music and I remember the Mm. feeling of like, he loves me. Like right now he loves me and, and he loves me. And it was just gorgeous. I gave my life to him that day. I kind of like finally understood kind of, he did this for me, like Mm. the cross and it was for me and it was very personal And I said, I'm never, because you said yes voluntarily to die for me, I won't say no to you. And and until this day, I have that deal with him. You tell me what you want me to do. I'll do it. Mm -hmm. I I live for you because I wanted to die. So now it's like, instead of dying, I'll allow all that hate to die. I'll allow that, I'll allow that resentment to die and, and live for you. 
and that's since I was 25, that's what I've been doing now, kind of preaching and, and, and speaking and loving as best as I can while learning to love myself. And the yeah. more that I love myself, the better I can love, the, the healthier mm. I can love. I used to love out of guilt. I used to love out of people pleasing. That's not healthy love for anybody. Now I can love because I've loved myself. And, and when I do love myself, mm-hmm. everyone else kind of also flourishes around me. My children, my husband, you know, um, women that I mentor. Um, and it was those, those first few years and still today sometimes where I'm like, Hey, 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 take some time to love yourself. Like mm-hmm. you're, you know, take some time to rest. Um, and I, I just, I love him so much. I, I love him for loving me, his mercy. It was really, if there was one thing that I could say transformed me, it was his mercy. The fact that he knows it all and loves me and, and, and has withheld punishment, has withheld mm-hmm. out of that he paid the price for me. There was a ransom for me. Like I know other people that deserve ransoms there. You know, you could say, oh, she's great, though. And she's never done what I did. Yeah. No, no, no. There was a ransom for me. Like and uh, I just I can't get over it. I don't want to get over it. I love Jesus Amazing. so much. And, and even I can in this, feel that. Yeah, I can feel that through. So. I think everybody's going to be wondering and wanting to ask the question, whatever happened to your abuser and were you able to forgive him? What was the process for that? Because I think it, you, you're looking at a life and you're listening and going, okay, so, so much of what Rosie's been through clearly stems from, you know, the abuse, the secrecy. There's a lot of pain in that, right? Mm-hmm. So he was a fugitive. Was he found? And what was the process for you in forgiving him? So I received... Uh, I, I came on to the way at, in November of 2005 and we had been looking for him for eight years now, nine years. So 18 years had passed since the abuse started. And, and it, you know, I knew I needed forgiveness for the abortion. That's what I really wanted off of me among other things. And I really wanted to break free from the porn addiction. It, it was just killing me. Mm-hmm. And So in in that conversation with Jesus of like, forgive me of my sins, and I start really diving into the word, it's, well, forgive so that your sins could be forgiven. I I don't get it. What do you mean? And so there was a lot of like me asking God and spending time with him. um, And he takes me to the story of Stephen, the martyr who was being stoned. And in that moment said, don't even count it against them. That blew my mind. Because, mm-hmm. you know, in our mind, it's like, no, count it, count it double. And I have a whole list of counts you can have mm-hmm. against this person. And, and I said, well, who was he imitating? And then, you know, or who did he learn this from? And it's Christ on the cross saying, forgive them, Father, they don't know what they do. And I had a whole conversation with Jesus and my abuser did know. He did know teaching children, touching children was wrong, but he didn't know the depth of, of what it would cause probably. So I had to have that whole discussion. And I learned that you can't minimize it. Sometimes when we want to forgive someone, we'll say, oh, but he's sick. Oh, but maybe he was abused too. Oh, but maybe he was drunk. All true, but don't minimize it. Mm -hmm. Take the sin 100% for what it is against you so that you can forgive that 100%. Because when you minimize it, you're only forgiving 50% of it. And that other 50 is going to linger and you're going to say, you're going to feel bad for them, but that's going to become resentment because pity, I mean, compassion is different from pity. When you pity someone, it it doesn't take action and then it becomes resentment. Mm -hmm. So I, God, you know, was like, show it all to me. And, and Rosie, let me be the judge. You are so weary and so tired because you've put on this big robe that doesn't belong to you. It's too heavy. And you don't only want to be the judge. You want to be the attorney defending you. And then you want to be the jury too. You just, just be the the person that was injured. I'll handle the rest. And he Mm -hmm. kind of showed me how there was like this spiritual court I could go to. And it was just him and I, it was him and I every day for like three months in his presence. I would cry. I would sometimes not even be able to speak. I would journal anything that I could do to to get this out of me. I wanted it out of me. I was exhausted from being bitter and angry. I I was at the point of like, I just, I want energy back in my life. And so how do I take it out? It, It was at church, at home with music, journaling. These are all good ways of just, just get it out of you so that God can then fill it with something else. Well, that was November, December, January. After nine years of him being a fugitive, 
I saw him down the street at a restaurant. What? What? And I, I froze. I couldn't move. I saw him and my, I was speaking with a girlfriend and she's like, Rosie, breathe. You're not breathing. What's wrong with you? By this time she knew who he was, but I couldn't move until he saw me and he froze and he looked a little bit different. Like there had been some plastic surgery. I was like, what's, but I know it's him. I know those eyes. Mm -hmm. He gets so scared. He leaves too. He leaves the woman he was with there. She has no ride. Just walks right by me. (gasps) And I, and then I said, Gladys, that's him. Go get his plates is all I could say. It's all that came out of him. She dashes after him, but he had left by then. And I call my sister and I'm like, I am so sorry. I am the dumbest. Why sister? What? And I told her and she's like, don't no, no, no. This is a good thing. I love how she always saw something good. Mm-hmm. And she said, now you can identify him. And every year she would ask me, are you ready? Are you ready to speak up? Because now her platform had grown. She was, now she was huge. It was 2005. She was doing great in the U.S. and Mexico. And she said, God gave me this microphone with a responsibility. And when you are ready, baby sister, we're going to use it. I won't do it until you're ready. And I love her for that. Because although Mm -hmm. it was also her story, she knew that I need to be ready to speak it. And I am going to beg all moms and cousins and sisters, don't tell a story without their permission. Mm -hmm. I know you're doing it with good intentions, but we feel sometimes like everyone knows our story and no one comes and talks to us and they probably don't know what to say, but we start feeling like everyone has these thoughts about us. My sister would not allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. She was waiting. She had waited nine years. And that day she asked me until you're ready, baby sister, are you ready? And I said, I am ready. So she said, okay, we're gonna do an interview on the biggest platform we can find. And then we're going to do a radio interview. So in February, um, we did a a TV interview on a, on a very uh, important Spanish channel here in the U S and then we did a radio show and people started calling in. I know him. He is my neighbor and he will just, when he gets drunk, he goes on talking about Jenny and how he used to beat her and control her. So he incriminated himself and her fans were ready. Like, and, um, yeah, we, they, we, uh, an investigator came, a, a Christian FBI agent who had, who was in LA at the time. He's, he's from Puerto Rico. And he said, I'm not even supposed to get involved. So I'm not working. I'm volunteering here. I'm going to help you find him. He didn't even give me his real name. He said, just call me Angel because I feel God has sent me to help you. He investigated his whole vacation time, which was about two weeks, found him. And I got to identify Mm -hmm. him. So my sister was right. No, He found him? So it was a private investigator that found him. Mm -hmm. He was living an exit away from my sister. So my sister lived on like Lincoln. He was the next street over. He like, he was staying close to make sure, you know, cause it was the least place we would look for him. And oh April 22nd, 2007, uh, I feel like the Lord just put him in my hand. Just here he Unbelievable. is. Unbelievable. Wow. And I got to be there when he was arrested and all this process of forgiving and journaling and praying and crying I really, really transformed me because now I had him in front of me and my whole life I had planned, I'm going to, I'm going to slap him. I'm going to tell him he didn't break me. I have so much to show him. There was no need. I was at peace. I was, I was healing and I felt compassion for him, which I know is not me. That's only the Holy (laughs) Spirit that lives Mm -hmm. inside me because I thought I'm released from my jail. I'm free now. I'm Mm -hmm. no longer a prisoner of depression of trauma. I'm being released. And now he's going into jail. And I saw his eight-year-old daughter cling to him. And and now she was hurting. So I just had compassion for him. And I said, Lord, you do what you need to do with him. And and we went to to, um, a court case for a year, a full year, seeing him once every few months. Mm. I got to testify. And I remember the the verse God gave me right before testifying because it was it was horrific to say any of these words in front of my father and a mm-hmm. jury and to still think, what if they don't believe me? Mm-hmm. I don't have evidence anymore. This is so many 18 years later. I've already been sexually like there, it, it was victim blaming that I was afraid of. 
or lack of evidence. And the Lord gave me Psalm 27. Like, I'm with you. Who do you fear? Like, if it, it was just so powerful to me to read that. And I still hold it onto my heart whenever I'm scared. I'll go to Psalm 27. And I was able to testify. And he was convicted of eight out of the nine counts, 31 years without the possibility of parole. He will be released when he's 74 years old. Wow. And the Lord only knows wow. why. My prayer was no longer his punishment. My prayer was allow him to reconcile with you because he, he used to be a believer, at least in church. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know that whole situation. That's him and God. But I said, let him have a relationship with you and save him because that will be a real kick in the teeth to the devil. Not only am I saved, he's saved too, mm-hmm. because no one has to go to hell. No one has to die. No one, no one has to be condemned forever. If I'm forgiven for killing a child in my womb, he can be forgiven for hurting a child when she was eight. And that is kind of how I saw it. From what I hear now, he has reconciled with the Lord. He's leading Bible studies. And that's a victory to me. That is a victory for the kingdom because his punishment doesn't heal me. And that's what a lot of people think. If I get justice, then I'll feel better. You don't. You yeah. it, it does. You do think like, hey, the world is working and, and justice does something for all of us. The justice of one can help all of us, right? Mm-hmm. But it won't necessarily heal you. What heals you is Christ, is the cross, is the relationship with him. What gives you peace is forgiving him. And, and it's all very easily said, I've been through the process. It is, it is difficult to walk through the door that gave you the pain in the first place, yeah. but you're worth it. You, you are really, really worth it. Mm. Do the work until, 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 until you have that peace, until you are fully healed. And it is a process. But once I just surrendered to Christ, really the surrender was, I'm no longer defending myself. I'm no longer the judge. I don't set the sentence. I don't even want to be the jury. Lord, you do it. When I hold up my hands and surrender, it is not losing. It is not being weak. When I surrender, it is the strongest point that I can be because now I can focus on my healing. Mm-hmm. That This book, God is Your Defender, is, is so that we let go of the revenge. God is ready to defend us. But if we don't allow him to, because we're going to gossip about it, we're going to write a Yelp review, we're going <laughs> to tell everyone... I mean, yes, you do vent. And and I would say vent to a counselor, to a mentor, who's someone who can feed something back into you. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we're venting to 20 people. We're letting everyone know. We want everyone to be their enemy. Um, That only your focus is so much on revenge that you don't that you haven't even thought about healing. And what if we reversed it? What if we let God handle it? Praying. And there are some practical steps on how, what do I do while I'm waiting? Because sometimes God in our timing takes longer. What do I do in the meantime? Do I ever speak up? When do I speak up? Those are things that I speak up, that I, that I say in the book, just based off my, my personal experiences. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, I'm focusing on healing. I'm I'm doing self-care, self-love. I'm doing counseling. And when I do that, that's when my past doesn't affect my children. I, I refuse to let That's my me. anger mm-hmm. live in my home. I don't want my children to see me as this always angry, ready to fight mama. I want them to see I'm trusting. I mean, I am upset, but let's see, let, let's take it to God first before I speak mm-hmm. up. Let's, and, and my children, thankfully, are no, not afraid of me. Um, they are open to come and talk to me. They know when mama's praying, they, 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 they will see my trust in the Lord in this situation and all my situations. And I pray that then they can trust the Lord. Mm-hmm. And, and I've just focused more on my healing and it expedited when I finally let the vengeance. Mm-hmm. Rosie, that's fantastic. And I love that whole idea. God is your defender. Uh, I know I want to switch a little bit, but I know that this is a question that's come up and something I've been asked, you know, thinking about. And there, there's been so much, I mean, I will say this to you. And just getting to know you, it's amazing. It is a miracle that you are here today. Like just yes. hearing what you have gone through, the choices you've made and where it could have led, it is, it's really miraculous, astonishing, supernatural, incredible that you are here today. And I think yes. in those places, you know, woman to woman, it's, I really just want to honor and celebrate that you are here. I think it's, it's, it's beautiful. One thing I do want to say, because 
it, it's so profound too of your story is the loss of Jenny. And I yeah. say this because in a year that we've been through with loss, grief mm -hmm. and lament and so much loss of people that we love and people and, you know, every day people lose people. I, I think, you know, I think I just want to hear a bit of your, just a process. I know that this could be a whole other show, but just to encourage people too on how you have processed just the incredible loss of a sister that you, that you love. Uh, because I think that would really strengthen and help people today. It's a lot. I know. Yes. I know to bring no, that onto all of this, but I just think it's really important. I was thinking about it. I was praying through it to say, I think I, that no, I will think, speak to a lot of people. I think the question is perfect because it is, it was my biggest fear. Jenny dying was the only thing I feared. And really? then she mm. dies. I mean, because he had threatened to kill her, I lived with that fear my whole life. And I would tell her, please don't die. Please don't die. And um, when she does die, I, you know, I was already a believer. Thank God I was pregnant with my child, my, my second child with Sammy. And I had told her my whole life, hey, if you die, you know, I'll become crazy. I'll, I'll, you'll find me like li mentally ill. I will become either depressed or, or alcohol and drugs are going to be my go-to. Like this is what I would declare before I knew Christ. I had seven great years of, of making this foundation with Christ. And then she dies. I am a newlywed and pregnant with my second child. Life was fantastic. I had a nine to five job. I loved my life so much. I was beginning to speak and preach and writing my first book. And then she dies and everything crumbles again. I, I saw it like ruins. My life was in ruins publicly. And it was so difficult. And I said, Lord, you're still good. I, there's none of this looks good, but I, I know my mind knows. So what are, what, what good can come of this? And I was in deep pain, but now I was running her estate. I am still running her estate guardian of her children. And my, my mother was broken. I didn't, I didn't know what to do. It has been a very difficult eight years personally, spiritually, and professionally, all mm -hmm. with cameras on me. And I'm a very, I'm, I'm the girl that would hide behind books. Mm -hmm. Don't talk to me. I'm antisocial. Mm -hmm. And now, so I know that the Lord, when I gave him my life and I said, I'll do what you want me to do, he heard. And that mm -hmm. I always kept in my, I, okay, I said, God, my life is in your hands. So I'm trusting you. Do you want to show people restoration? because you're going to restore me and, and people are going to watch. And my prayer to this day is that in my brokenness and all my mistakes, I've made so many mistakes in these eight years on video <laughs> because people will always pull out a phone. I mean, I was angry. I, I dabbed into drinking a little bit. You know, you go back, you know how mm -hmm. Peter went back to fishing after Christ died. And I, and I allow people to see it. Because I think, I've, I believe, Lord, that you are restoring me and that this will be now Rosie's story, God's story of how much he loves us. And, we'll, and as long as we're willing, he'll continue to restore. So now I'm in a whole way better place in, in that sense. Um, but I believe that the, the death, where is your sting? And the, 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 the resurrection, I am the resurrection and what Mary must have felt it is kind of like being shown now a little bit through my life. And so with a year like COVID, I know what the first year is like. There, there is the death of your loved one. And then there's the first birthday and the first Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. And those are the days that I feel for all of us. This, these, we're going through the firsts. At, you know, it's 2021 and we're, we're getting out and we're talking about masks and vaccination. And I get all that. But my thought is, let's give each other mercy. Let's give each other grace. Um, there's so much anger and emotion going on that we are just ready to take out all those emotions on each other. My family was destroyed after my sister's death. People think, oh, death unites us. If we don't have mercy and love for each other, it can destroy us. Well, you're not honoring her. Well, you are this and you're using her death and just angry. And what are you doing for her birthday? And just anger. So... 
as a society, as a world, Mm -hmm. because it's the firsts, what if we just give each other extra love? You know, what if we send the flowers on Mother's Day? What if we write the note celebrating life? What if we respect each other's grief and say, she's just having a bad day today. I'm not going to take it personally. She's not really mad at me. She's mad at death. I don't know. And really let things go. Oh, so she just kind of cursed me out. I'm hurt, but I'm going to talk to her about it later. I'm going to let some time pass because I know it's not me. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I, it's not weakness. It's meekness and showing each other love. I have the power to tell you off and tell you that you're wrong and you're not handling this death well. But I won't because I don't know what handling death well is. And that's what I feel after a year of COVID, after knowing death, after facing it every morning. Death will just laugh in your face. You wake up thinking, I'm gonna have a good day and death will just tell you, are you crazy? Your your best days are behind you. I I won here. And then just going back to Christ and asking, hey, did he win? And letting Christ remind you, no, I won. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna, you know, it's, it's a daily thing. And sometimes the only words that could come out of my mouth were, Holy, uh, Holy Spirit, help me. You're my helper, capital H. Can you help me? Mm-hmm. That That's all I had some days. And I was running her empire and trying to help her children. Now, eight years later, um, I still cry. I still miss her. But the healing process has been beautiful. I have met Christ in a whole different way. And he has taught me that he does have victory. Sometimes we feel if you've lost someone, I totally understand that you feel I'll never get over this pain. It'll always be with me. Mm -hmm. I'll just get used to not having her. I would recommend, if you can, watch those statements. Maybe you feel them, but don't don't declare them as a truth Mm -hmm. because there is the hope of a different truth. I always hoped that Christ could heal me, that he could heal anything, even the loss of my sister. He could heal, if he can heal, heal cancer and sexual abuse and he can break the chains of pornography, then he, mm. he, could, he could heal death, the, the, the loss. And he has. And again, it's been a process, but he has healed it. And I'm, and I'm on my way there. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to let people know there is that hope. And knowing everything I've been through, DV, sexual assault, sexual abuse, and him never failing then, He's not going to fail now. He's not going to yes. start with Jenny's death. So he won't fail you. They're, just open the space for it. Just just open the possibility that maybe Christ can heal that that void, that hurt that you have. And and he will. And I he's done it for me. I miss her and I, I love her. And I mm-hmm. am excited to see her in heaven. She reconciled with Christ a week before she passed away. So I, I know I'm going to see her. But I don't have to wait to be healed. I can, I can live abundantly even now. That's amazing. Rosie, what's in your future? What is your hope for your future? What's ahead for you? I, um, I want to be finished with this assignment of, of being my sister's trustee. Okay. It's an assignment. It's a purpose. God has purpose in it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very happy with what I've done, but I want to be available for the Holy Spirit. I feel that I've been on assignment and, and, and it's still ministry It's just, it's not, you know, my favorite part. So I'm hoping I'm praying that, uh, I can continue to preach and speak. I want to speak in jails. I want to speak in juvenile halls. I want to speak at schools. I want to speak in homes everywhere to give the hope of Christ. And, and my dream is to do it with my family. I have an 18 year old daughter, seven year old girl and a four year old boy. And I, and my husband's a worshiper. So my dream of dreams today, right now, is like, what if, I don't know, we just serve (laughs) him, Mm -hmm. impacting the world, healing people. I want to tell my story until until people are healed and saved, until they know Christ as their hope, until they have healthy relationships. I want to speak until the statistics go down. I mean, it's one in four girls, one in seven boys. What if we speak so much about it? that predators become scared. They start saying, this little girl is going to speak up. That right. little girl is hearing this one speak about it. What if it becomes one in a hundred? What if it becomes one in zero one day if we just speak up enough yeah. about it? So oh, that's my dream. That's chill. And that's I'll, a great and I'll dream. Anything. I'll use books. I'll use, I don't like to sing, but I'll try it. I mean, <laughs> I, I'll do what God needs me to do. 
that, to, to be able to really impact the world that yeah, way. Yeah, amazing. Rosie Rivera, author of God is Your Defender. I mean, there are so many words I can <laughs> say. I mean, not only overcomer and survivor, but just you have inspired me. <sighs> just so many lessons here as we talk about, you know, sort of this, this you know, strengthening one another. I mean, there was things that I, I just pulled out, Rosie, on on prayer and speaking out about people that they can't say about themselves, you know, just praying out to God, you know, and, and speaking to him faithfulness and perseverance and forgiveness. There is so much in your yes. story that has really encouraged me. And I know will I and has it. encouraged our listeners. So thank you, Rosie, for being with thank us. You. It was a pleasure Listening it is an to honor learning. for me. And Thank I hope you. that we can connect again because what a tremendous, I'm excited to see where God's going to take you. And oh, let's pray you. that you're right, that, you know, we, we create a culture where, you know, people are speaking up and we will see, you know, predators gone and afraid. And so, I mean, that would be a, an amazing prayer today. So thank you so yes. much. Thank you. And God, Melinda. And God bless you and all that you do. I'm honored to be a part of this amazing series with so many impactful people. And just thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll come on whenever you need me to come All right, on. Thank perfect. For and then, yeah. And then when you come on, come to Canada, you've got to come up and, yes. and hang out with us. I'd love okay. to. I'd love to. Thank Thanks you so much. So much.